See, do you remember he invited Jesus into his house to find out a bit more who this really was and had his doubts and came to the conclusion, well, if he was a true prophet, he'd know about this woman who's a sinner. And Jesus loved her because he had, she was a forgiven sinner. And he clearly taught about that. And we've been saying, well, what, what does it mean to recognise who Jesus is? It means to hear his word with humility and to meet that word with faith. Real, true, saving faith, not just a curiosity about what Jesus does, or what he says even, but actually recognising that the things that he says and the things that he does prove that he is the Lord. He is the one sent from God. That's the sort of saving faith that we need. Knowing his true identity, confirmed by the signs that he does. His healings are signs to us that really he is the one true God. For only God has power over the deep. We saw that in the middle of a storm on the lake with his disciples. Speaks a word. And that storm is calm immediately. He goes across to the other side of that lake and meets with this man possessed by so many demons it causes uh, thousands of pigs to rush down the hill and into the sea. Such was the mayhem that they were causing. And yet he commands, and those demons, leave the man and go into those pigs. He is the one who, when he says, little girl, arise, she comes from her death back to life. No one can do that but God. And if he gives us ears to hear that, we too will rejoice in that truth. And before Jesus brings the question home to his disciples, who do you say that I am? We'll see that probably next week from verse 18. Before that, Luke's got three more scenes that he's collected together to demonstrate who Jesus really is. To help us answer this question, who is this Jesus? It's the question that Herod asks. So that's our title for this morning. Who is this? Who is this Jesus? I'm going to see firstly that he's the one who sends out in power. He's the one who is sought by the perplexed. And he's the one who saves those in peril. So that's just a heads up of where we're heading through these first 17 verses of Luke chapter 9. Firstly then, he sends out in power, verses 1 to 6, as he calls these 12 followers together to him, and he gives them the authority. Uh, these disciples have been following him closely and learning so much from this teacher, marvelling at the things that he says, the things that he does. What a journey they've been on. So now it's time for a practical lesson. For Jesus has them on a pathway, not just to be followers of him, watching in awe as he does these amazing things, but to be the ones that he then sends out. So they're going to turn from being disciples to being apostles. Apostles means the ones sent, sent with the authority of one greater than them to do his work. And so he gives them this power and authority, his own power and authority, so they can do these mighty works, these signs to show that they are about the king's business. This is the message of the kingdom. And here's proof that you can believe us because we can cast out demons. We can heal disease, but only in the name of Jesus, only by his authority and power. So don't go drawing attention to themselves, pointing to God's king who rules in the kingdom. And what a lesson in faith they are to learn as they go in obedience to his sending. As he tells them uh, that they can do these things in his name, by his power, and that they can depend on him completely. So there's normal practical provisions that you would make for a trip like this, a mission the bags uh, and shoes and, and um, the bread provisions, money, even a change of underwear. The, the two tunics 
the word there, the footnote in my Bible says a chit on, and that's what they wore next to the skin, like a long garment. They wear some overcloaks on top of that. So the stuff, you know, like a vest and pants, really. Uh, they don't need to take a change of underwear, even. It may seem surprising to us, wondering what was going on. But they were to depend upon the power and, and uh, enabling of Jesus in every single part. This was the lesson for them, that they could, they could really trust Jesus, even in the smallest of things. Now, this was not a, 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 a kind of prescriptive thing for all time. This is the only way to do mission. For uh, If you turn briefly to chapter 22, we'll see near the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. Uh, he gives them, he draws out the lessons for them. Uh, chapter 22, verse 35, Jesus said to the disciples, when I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? And they said, nothing. So they'd learned the lesson, they'd experienced Jesus' provision. That's really good, isn't it? They could depend on him for all things. Jesus said to them, but now, let the one who has a money bag take it, and likewise a knapsack, and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. And we'll go on, God willing, when we get there, to think more about what he's saying. He's saying, things are going to change this time. So you will need those provisions because people will not be welcoming and you will not have that provision from God in the same way that you experience there. So as they go out, they are to depend on people responding to the message with practical help for them. They weren't going to magically receive things from heaven. People would be moved to offer them accommodation, food, presumably to do their washing for them. And that would be a great experience for them. They would learn so much. And sure enough, they learn much as they're welcomed, as they're provided for. But Jesus warns them, don't expect universal welcome. There will be those who, in spite of all, all the evidence, all that's so clear of the authority in which you come, and the power that's been granted to you, they will still reject you. Don't be concerned about that. Don't give up. Just move on. Go to the next place. Or well, they will be maybe more willing to receive the message of life. Of course, to reject the message of the apostles sent in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ was to reject Christ himself. Uh, to not hear the word is to put yourself outside of the kingdom of God. And the same is true to them. So Jesus has concern for this wider area that they too should understand who he is. And so he sends these uh, disciples out to proclaim the gospel and perform those signs. And what a lesson it was for them to learn for themselves just what they were involved with. So not just about one uh, powerful man doing great deeds and then that would come to an end. This was about the whole of the rest of history and the whole of the rest of eternity being about Jesus as King. So as we notice Jesus having this concern to spread the message far and wide, we give thanks that the Lord had concern for so many people. He sends his disciples out in power to the people. He has concern for those disciples that they would understand more. They'd be enriched in faith as they serve as they take him at his word and go. They would learn so much. They would grow so much in their faith. And as they saw the power of the gospel at work in lives, they could bank that for what was to come. For through them, the Lord Jesus Christ was going to do amazing things in this world. And through those who are sent with that same message, he's still doing amazing things in this world. Jesus at work in power to bring the kingdom of God. So he sends out in power. But secondly, he is sought by the perplexed, verses 7 to 9. Often Herod is referred to as King Herod, but Luke has the slightly more precise term. He is the Tetrarch. 
And what the Romans did was they divided up the inhabited land of Israel, their, their colony, into four parts. And so a, a tetrarch ruled over a quarter of the territory. And this is the Herod who was the tetrarch of the Galilee area where these things were taking place. And as any good governor or tetrarch would have, he's got people who can tell him what's going on and reports would come into his palace where he stayed. And that's understandable, isn't it? These were such significant events that were taking place. People must have been talking about them constantly. Even when Jesus told people, don't, don't mention this. You know, do you remember the parents of that little child, the little girl who was raised from the dead? Don't tell anybody. Because he wants to be able to continue with his ministry of proclaiming the good news rather than being taken by grieving relatives on tours of um, uh, cemeteries to raise their dead relatives. It would have been a great distraction from the work that he was sent to do. But news comes of these public events. There's nothing done in secret. News reaches the palace. Perhaps even direct first-hand reports. Do you remember we saw how Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, so the top man in his palace, his wife is there on the front line. And surely she must have been sending back messages as to the things that were going on. So Herod's perplexed. He's hearing all these different theories about this great series of events, this great man who is touring in his patch. And he's trying to weigh up these various ideas. Is it Elijah, the great Old Testament prophet through whom God did wonderful signs for the people? Or is it John the Baptist? Well, I put him to death. I saw his head on a platter, Herod might be thinking. And you said, get a sense of this is a man who has a troubled conscience. He didn't want to kill John the Baptist, but was backed into a situation by his own foolishness where he was forced to behead John the Baptist. I think this man has a very troubled conscience. But more than that, it's difficult to really know why he's so keen to see, see Jesus. Do you see at the end of verse 9? And Herod <coughs> sought to see him. Herod is a very unstable character. We know that from sources outside of the Bible. So trying to nail down exactly what his motivation was uh, is quite difficult. Chapter 13 and verse 31, uh, we see uh, this verse. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to Jesus, get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. Now, it may be that Herod had issued a plan to kill Jesus, or maybe the Pharisees were just exploiting his reputation to silence Jesus because the Pharisees found Jesus quite a nuisance, to say the least. So maybe they were exaggerating, but maybe Herod did really want. And then, of course, you remember at the end of Luke chapter 22 and verse, sorry, chapter 23 and verse 8. So this is part of the trial of Jesus, um, and Pilate hears that he's from Herod's patch, so thinks, well, I can offload a bit of responsibility, let's send him off to Herod and he can deal with this problem. Uh, and when Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So at this stage earlier on, Herod presumably is wanting Jesus to make a trip to the palace. I doubt very much Herod would be willing to mingle amongst the vast crowds that by this time were following Jesus so that he might catch a glimpse, catch a word. He was hoping perhaps for a private audience, see something magnificent for himself. But even by the end of, of the Gospel, we see that Herod is not sincere in his seeking. He's just kind of a bit curious. And Christ doesn't engage with him during his trial. And Luke doesn't record any account of Jesus going and visiting him in the palace either. If you're wanting to make a name for yourself, get on the right track in worldly terms, of course you would head to the palace and 
try and get the, the ruler on side, but Jesus knows that his kingdom doesn't operate to worldly standards. Isn't interested in uh, getting the support and, and validation of somebody like Herod. And so he leaves him. That's a lesson to us, isn't it? Because so often people, ourselves included perhaps at some point, can hear about Jesus uh, and we're, we're perplexed, we're, we're curious about the things that Jesus stands for, all that he's able to do, all the things that he says. And we just sort of think, well, what's this all about? And maybe we think, well, if we had some definitive proof, if we actually saw Jesus, well, that would make all the difference. And sometimes people stay perplexed by these things because Jesus will not uh, go along with their agenda. He's done plenty to prove who he is. It's not for us to demand personal signs, proofs of who he is and what he says. Of course, Luke is keen for us to understand that the things that are recorded were real historical events. And unlike so many religious leaders that we have uh, in our world today, the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did can be attested. It can be checked out because these things happened in a historically public way. You can't do that with other religious leaders. You can't verify whether these things were true or not. But even when people look into something like Luke's Gospel, there's an accurate historical record. And that's, that's accepted by scholars who are not Christians. They, they, they say Luke's Gospel is, shows all the signs of an accurate historical recording of the events of that time. They can be presented with these things and yet they remain perplexed because the obvious answers that come from reading Luke's gospel are not comfortable for them. It doesn't suit their world view, their, their view of themselves. And so time and again people will be presented with the evidence and then will refute it or perhaps even try to prevent it from being extended and proclaimed further. And we see that in many places, don't we? in our own country, in academic places, in other countries, through the, the governing authorities. They must silence the message of Jesus because it doesn't suit them, even though it's true. Well, we give thanks if we have moved from being just perplexed and interested in Jesus to accepting that he really is the king. And he will accomplish his purposes in spite of the opposition of the likes of Herod or whoever else may stand against him. So Jesus, who is he? He's the one who's sought by the perplexed. But then thirdly, and this familiar uh, story that's in all of the gospel accounts, thirdly, serving uh, those in peril, verses 10 to 17. Well, the apostles, notice the word there, on their return, the apostles, the ones who had been sent, they report the success. It, it was true. All, all the things that you said we could do, we could do. And we're here. We haven't starved to death. We haven't been uh, eaten by wild animals because we have no place to stay. You have provided for us. We have learned the lessons. But Jesus knows perhaps they need that space to absorb the lessons. And so off they go to uh, a, a, a desolate place so that in their weariness they might rest and just take that time. But that private fellowship, that private time with Jesus, of course, is interrupted. It's short-lived because the crowd's here where he is and they arrive, even though it's a desolate place. They leave behind their villages, their safe places, and they seek out Jesus. Is there a desire to hear the truth that he proclaims. Sure, they want to be part of the healing that he performs, to benefit from that blessing. There's something about Jesus that's so attractive, his compassion and concern for people, to tell them what's true. It's almost addictive. And so they leave and then head out to him. And isn't it wonderful, as these crowds come, Jesus welcomes them. 
He too must have experienced the exhaustion of the ministry, knowing that he had needy apostles to, to help. But he welcomes and provides for their need as he speaks the truth to them, as he brings healings for those who are sick. What a comfort, isn't it? We've got such a saviour who is filled with compassion, who welcomes us in our weariness. Never feel that you are wearying Jesus. Sorry, it's me again. Sorry to trouble you. Jesus welcomes us. He, he loves to help those who recognise their need. Well, there are others, of course, who recognise the need, because this session seems to go on long. Huge numbers of crowds to minister to. And perhaps rather than listening to, this is conjecture here, rather than listening, the disciples had been reading the health and safety policy. <coughs> and a risk assessment was demanded. Action was required because they were in danger of a major problem. Because the day was running out. And daylight is very important when you live in a dark country. With dangerous people and dangerous animals occupying those desolate places. And in a hot country, you need to keep your food and water levels up. So they were, they were going to have a catastrophe on their hands. So Jesus, it's time to call a halt, send them away. Because it's too risky. There's going to be an exhaustion, emergency. But rather than Jesus saying, yeah, okay, I'll command the crowd to go away, he gives them, the disciples, a command. Instead, verse 13, you give them something to eat. And they're thinking, well, what have we got? And that's perhaps a reasonable response to the question. As they think about their five loaves and two fish, other Gospels tell us that those have been uh, commandeered from a little boy's lunchbox. But obviously, completely inadequate for this vast crowd. But we learn of 5,000 men, but there'll be many more, with women and children included as well. But rather than remembering the lessons that they'd learned on their mission, their focus on the inadequacy of their resources. Jesus had just provided for them for however long they were travelling around doing the missionary work that Jesus had given them. Had they forgotten that lesson? Or did they just assume it didn't apply to such a vast crowd that was way beyond a reasonable provision? Here, in the wilderness, there are hungry people. What to do? Well, God provides for them. It echoes back to the book of Exodus. They come out into the wilderness from Egypt, from slavery, set free by the mighty hand of God who provided for them so wonderfully. And yet soon they were complaining. But God provided for them bread from heaven. They went out in the morning and it was something they'd never seen before. And so they cried out, Mana! Which means, what is it? And for 40 years, God provided that manna for them to eat. All that they needed and be satisfied. But here in the wilderness, those uh, hundreds of years later, perhaps the question should be, who is it? I don't know what the Hebrew would be for that. So instead of manna, what is it? The question is, who is it that's commanding us to provide food for this vast crowd. If they remember the lessons that had been learning on their missionary trip, they would say, well, he's given us a command, and he will therefore give us the ability, the, the resources, we don't know how, but somehow we believe that he has told us to do this, and he will give us the ability to do it. But they've forgotten that lesson. And they have to receive further instructions from him. Now, of course, Jesus could have rained down bread and meat and whatever else from heaven or cause it to sprout out of the ground. Such is his power over creation. 
But he decides to use what the disciples have in all its inadequacy. It's a completely pitiful amount of food. But Jesus uses them, uses that to feed this vast crowd. And so in faith, they bring what they do have to Jesus. Perhaps it was, you know, only cupped hands was enough to hold this little amount. They bring it to Jesus, he takes it. He gives thanks to God for it. He then divides it and gives it back. And it's an act of faith for them, isn't it? To then overcome those shouting voices, if you like, in their heads saying, this is just stupid. I'm not even able to give enough food to this first pass. Presumably all 12 had a part of the five and the two. So the, the, the amount that they were then left with was, was not enough to feed the first person in the queue. They got themselves organized into groups of 50 and sat down so it might be an orderly thing. This is not nearly enough. And yet that act of faith of giving is the hand and the mighty power of God providing plenty so that all the people ate. The little that they did have became so much for that first person and the next person and the row behind and right at the back and then the hundredth group right at the back thinking we're not going to get any of this ever but there was enough because of Jesus providing for their needs and teaching those disciples through that experience demonstrating beyond that who he is for all the people gathered and for those disciples who, who learned what faith meant as they served as they saw this impossible feat accomplished even through their obedience so they had the faith they were learning to have faith that remembers who it is that commands and not listen to the voices that say this can never be. This is just impossible. Who commands us? He will provide. Do we remember that our Lord Jesus Christ is indeed just that? He is the Lord. He has power beyond our imagination. Or do we come with a faith that waits for all of our doubts to be cleared up? That's not really faith, is it? That's faith in our own ability to reason whether Jesus is worth putting our trust in. He's answered all of our questions. When all of our doubts have been removed, then we'll trust him. Now, Jesus calls us to trust him for who he is. And to take the little that we have and do as he says. Not to stop saying, well, we're just... Too little. It's, it's impossible. We can't do this. But to step forward in faith. It's such a lesson for us from this famous passage, isn't it? Don't put our faith in our own provisions, our own abilities, our own knowledge, our own strength. The disciples in uh, John's account, John chapter 6, verse 9, they look at it. They look at the five and the two and say, what are these? Amongst so many. Or we might be tempted to think, who am I to accomplish such a great work? When, I, when we're looking in on ourselves and our resources, our faith would rightly be small. Instead, we ask that question, who is this? Who is he who commands these things? And when we grasp, then we gladly serve. We see this as an opportunity to be a part of something so much greater. He has commanded it. Will he not therefore provide for all of our needs and those to whom he sends us? How gracious Jesus is in teaching us patiently, time and time again, who he is. Yes, we will feel our inadequacies. And he graciously grants situations to come into our lives where those inadequacies will be so acutely felt. But we don't allow our feelings to shape our response. 
but rather Jesus and who he is, his desires, his compassion, that to shape our response to what he says. What a situation that must have been. What an experience it must have been for those disciples to take so little and share in the joy of sharing out the food that the Lord miraculously, graciously provides for that vast crown. All were miraculously provided for, satisfied. They were saved from the peril that they were in because they'd been given a good meal. Jesus delights to save far more than just from hunger. And he calls us to use the little that we feel we have to be a part of that kingdom work. Not to put the supermarkets out of business by taking food to all the people and giving out free stuff, but to give what the food on that day pointed to, to tell of the one who is the bread of life. He is the provision for our deepest soul needs. He is the one who gave himself for us so that we might be eternally satisfied. And we want to, I want to explore that idea a little bit more this evening from John's Gospel, chapter 6. So we'll think a bit more about that. But just as a, a link as we close before our time of communion. Do we put our trust in Jesus, the bread of life? He was the one uh, that this miracle is pointing forward to, the one who truly satisfies. Uh, John chapter 6, verse 33. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. The people who had experienced this miraculous feeding in recent times, said they, they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Sounds even better than what you provided for us yesterday. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. That bread that you ate, that meal that you had, was pointing forward to the truth of who I am. I am the one sent from God. And as I lay down my life, as he goes on to say in verse 51 of that chapter, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Not literally, they're going to eat his body. But he was going to give himself up completely by dying on the cross. So that people might have life forevermore. It's a joy to be able to celebrate that as we take communion. That's really what we're remembering is that Jesus gave his body for us for there was no other way for sinners to be saved. There was no other way for hungry souls to be satisfied. Sin has eaten away at us but Jesus comes and fills that, that void, that emptiness, that distress. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. What's important for us to know then, isn't it? That the bread that we eat now, the cup that we drink from, are reminders, are symbols of those things. We're, we're not uh, eating and drinking the actual flesh blood of Christ, we're reminding ourselves that our faith must be holy in what Jesus provides. He alone can satisfy our need for salvation. We cannot rely on ourselves. 
our own provisions or anybody else's, but only what Christ has done. And we delight then to remember his death as the one who loved us so much and gave himself for us. That's what we remember by taking these symbols, declaring to ourselves, to one another, and before the Lord, Jesus, he is the one I love. He is the one I will serve as I await that upward call to his everlasting kingdom. Let's pray. <laughs> oh, Heavenly Father, we've seen again so much evidence of who Jesus is. Oh Lord, keep us from just being curious and wanting to know a bit more. Keep us from just being perplexed because we will not yield our understanding and our, our, our lives to the truth that's revealed in your word. May we be those who delight to humbly hear and obey the Master. And in obeying, see so much more of what he is able to do. Oh Lord, how we thank you that you grow our faith as we obey your word. May we hear them, may we understand, and may we respond aright. We thank you that these accounts point forward to these deeper truths. We thank you for uh, mysteries that are revealed in Christ. And as we remember his death now in a time of communion, Lord, we, we engage in, in these deep and profound mysteries of Christ giving himself for us. And as we partake by faith in him, we have the life that is in his name and his name alone but all only because he died for us on the cross. So we come with a spirit of thankfulness, of humility, of dependence upon you in every part, and for the glory of your name, as we bring our prayers in Jesus' name.